Well, welcome everybody. Um, here we are again at Australia at Home and today's discussion goes across the political aisle with two um, of the nicest former premiers. Uh, in the red corner, we have uh, South Australia, former South Australian Premier Jay Weatherall. And in the blue corner, um, we have New South Wales Liberal Premier Mike Baird. So welcome. Um, we are all on Indigenous land. Um, I'm on Gadigal land in the nation of the Aora people. And I'd like to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. So um, welcome everybody. The ground rules for anyone who hasn't been to one of these, it's pretty simple. It's designed to be relaxed, respectful and inclusive. So we will be welcoming questions and you can send them through on the chat. Um, first of all, a few things to give you a better experience. Turn your screen on to gallery mode and that's in the top right hand corner of your screen. Um, turn your cameras on so we can get a sense of the hundreds of people we've got uh, in this discussion and there are hundreds this time. Um, and also open the chat at the bottom of your screen so you can introduce yourself and send questions for our panellists. If you're having any tech issues, AFSA is on the tech support, so message her direct. And finally, we're videoing and um, placing this online later, so we'd like everyone to keep it as polite and respectful as possible. Okay, so to kick off, um, we usually ask people how they're surviving through these strange times. So Mike, perhaps you can tell us a little bit about what your life's been like over the last few weeks. Uh, well, thanks, Anne, and uh, great to be here with uh, Jay and um, everyone on a kind of really interesting and I think important topic. Um, in, you know, in terms of my past few weeks, um, obviously it's been amazing uh, to watch what's happened across the world, and you know, my heart really uh, reaches out to those communities that have been completely devastated uh, by what we've seen, and it's obviously a long way back economically, but in a in a personal context, um, I haven't had to commute to Melbourne. Um, so my commute's kind of gone from three hours and 15 minutes to um, 15 seconds. So that, that's been a, um, a positive. But, you know, what I've loved is, is the, just the reorientation of perspective of our family. Um, we've done much more together as family. Our dogs have never been fitter. Uh, they're getting walked every day. Uh, they're loving it. Um, in fact, they sometimes look at us and go, do we really have to go? Um, but, uh, yeah, the, the dinners with the family and... Um, the, the connection with people by Zoom, it, you actually realise how much you value friends and relationships. So it's, I, I think the perspective change is what's really struck me and, you know, what is really important sort of come to the fore. But um, it's been a good time overall, notwithstanding um, some of the very significant challenges that we're seeing. Okay, and Jay, how about you? Yeah, similar experience, really. I mean, it, I, I feel a little privileged... Uh, given that my life hasn't been, you know, adversely touched from the, the disease yet. And there's so many people that have uh, lost their lives and are struggling with the illness, as well as losing their jobs. So I feel a, a little bit guilty, actually, in being in this sort of relatively privileged position. But I actually have, I had similarly have found it quite um, refreshing just to be able to have, spend so much time with my two teenage girls and... Uh, there's also been a reform in our household. There's now a roster for cooking and uh, dishes. And uh, so that's been a, a, a massive uh, a shift in household dynamics. Um, I don't know whether it will survive the crisis, but anyway, it's there for the moment. Well, that sounds pretty good. Now, you've both written a joint piece in today's Guardian in support of the National Cabinet as a model for uh, decision-making in the future. Now, um, for those of us who have had uh, have worked in Canberra, we remember those fondly, those Premier's conferences and the Council of Australian Governments meetings, usually held in the depths of winter, and all the Premier's coming down and it being a sort of very ritualistic thing. Um, you've outlined why you think we should move to a new system of the National Cabinet. Um, perhaps you can tell us a little bit about why you think it'll work and 
also what was wrong with the old system. So I might start with Jay. Yeah, thanks, Anne. <clears throat> well, it has worked. Uh, I think that's the first thing to say. I mean, hats off to the, the nation's leaders for uh, one, coming up with the idea, um, and secondly, uh, participating in, in a way which uh, has charted a pathway for us through this crisis. And, you know, I, I suppose I come from the um, perspective about the Federation. I think we've got a pretty good Federation in this country. Uh, and uh, compared with other places, you know, like the United States, which really doesn't function uh, in a cooperative way at all, um, I think you know, we've, we've always had a reasonably good model. But I think that, that the COAG process is quite glacial. You know, you meet uh, three or four times a year if you're lucky. And, um, you know, the urgent tends to, to overtake the important. You, you, it's very difficult to get um, any serious grip on, on the big issues facing our nation that do require cooperation because you meet each other so infrequently. Um, and it does seem to me that there's something quite powerful about um, the nation's leaders meeting each other on a regular basis, being face to face, uh, and having and, and the, the sort of the, the dynamic that emerges when it's just the leaders in the room, when they have to front one another and they have to engage in a dialogue. Um, and then they know they're going to see each other next week. So there's no real, there's a bit of a political premium on cooperation. Uh, I think that's been the secret of the success. And they, they've charted us through the health crisis. And I think that uh, there's good prospects of us charting us through the, the economic crisis. And, and, and that's something that I think Mike and I think uh, would be a good reform that should be maintained. Yes, so Mike, do you want to give us your take on COAG and what its shortfalls were and, and what we can get out of this new process? Yeah, well, well quickly, I think Jay's um, covered it well. My, you know, my, my sense about the COAG, the, it's, it's, it's meeting infrequently, but it's, it's also part of the political process. So, so what, what tends to dominate are the, the political issues of the day, whether it be the individual state governments or, or the federal governments. Um, so before you get anywhere, the, the partisan or the political badge comes out, um, whereas if you look at what's happened in the national cabinet, actually political badges uh, on a whole, um, are kind of put to the side and the good of the, the nation and um, the collective effort in terms of the challenges we're facing um, appear to take hold. So I, I think it's how, how do we create a mindset and a safe space uh, for our nation's leaders uh, to address with some of the biggest challenges we face and do it in a way that has the political badge uh, put down and the good of the nation uh, picked up. And, you know, that's, the, that's what I think, well, Mike Jay, I think the National Cabinet's done a, a first-class job uh, with what we are facing, which is unprecedented. Um, our argument would be, well, if we keep this in place, there are many other challenges. And imagine if we could kind of keep, you know, this format and this thinking and this approach um, to some of those. So that would be my perspective. Okay, so um, now I don't want you to breach any confidences, although you're welcome to. Um, can you tell us perhaps a couple of the little war stories out of um, COAG and other meetings? I, I think one of you mentioned to me earlier that Tony Abbott had a retreat, which was um, quite successful, I think. Yeah, I, I mean, I can recall one night, actually, to, to Mike's point, I remember we were sitting around at dinner, the COAG dinner, and I think Mike was there, and... Tony Abbott said, oh, well, let's just get through tomorrow without having any fights. And I think I can recall saying, you know, really, is that, you know, is that the best we can do? You know, surely we can, people might confuse us for the nation's leaders. You know, we, we, we should actually have a bigger ambition for that. And so that was the, and then, then the, the, the conversation sort of kicked on. And I think um, there were a range of contributions. And then we, we eventually settled on this idea of a retreat uh, which we had at Victoria Bar Barracks in, in Sydney. And there were no advisors uh, there. Although when we arrived, Peter Credlin was sitting in the room, but uh, we, um, I think she was stuck through the tradesman's entrance. But, but there were, basically there were no bureaucrats, there were next to nobody there, except just the premiers and the prime minister. And we had really an extraordinary discussion, a very wide ranging discussion across a range of topics. And for me, 
it was the best meeting I'd ever been to at, at that forum. Now, soon after that, Tony Abbott lost his job and the momentum was lost. But I, it, what struck me was that face-to-face -face dialogue uh, just with the leaders was a really powerful thing. And Mike, have you got an example of a meeting that went well or particularly badly that you can share with us? Um, no, look, I think um, the the general reflection, it's, it, you know, as COAG, it was, it was often the arrival in. Um, so mm -hmm. there's, there's a doorstop on the way into the parliament. And what you did was you watched the premiers and, you know, if they felt they'd been shortchanged on federal funding on a particular issue or um, they were fighting a, a, a political context back home, often, you know, that manifests itself and it sort of dictated, you know, what we're about to, to face. So it's, you know, on the way in and on the way out. And that was kind of, you know, if you're measuring success, it's, you know, your message, you know, across the various states or territories happen, or the, the federal government, what was their political message or management of issue they were trying to do that. It was frustrating because that, that's what you kind of saw, not some of the big challenges. And I, and I agree that that retreat we went to um, was exhilarating. You know, there was, there was a sense mm. that we were connected into an opportunity to change the nation, you know, for a generation. And mm. yeah, how about we all work on that? And it was very, very, um, uh, sort of uplifting, uh, mm. and and it took you from the day to day. Although I do think I do remember. I mean, a slight side story, which I'm sure no one will share. But um, I uh, on that on that retreat, I don't know if you remember, Jay, but I I'd, many months earlier I'd done an illegal uh, U-turn. Uh, <laughs> That's true. <right. laughs> and um, it, it it landed in the media that day, so we were exhilarated, but at the same time I had to explain. Uh, why I'd done an illegal U-turn, uh, which is a fair, <laughs> you know, fair criticism, uh, actually. Um, but um, uh, the the point was at the core of that meeting was the intent and the energy. I, I hadn't seen anything like it, so I think that's that, that's why Jay and I are so passionate about it because you know we think the country could be much better if we did that much more. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we have a question from one of our audience participants, uh, Belinda Lowe, and um, I think they're going to call you up, Belinda. Um, hello. Um, I have tried to campaign um, to get COAG to raise the age of criminal responsibilities for quite a while, and it's been pretty difficult to get anything happening through COAG, but... Um, Mike, you were saying that you think that um, National Cabinet has allowed political badges to be put aside, but how much of the badges being put aside is due to the unprecedented circumstances of the COVID pandemic rather than the forum? And surely as, um, as the, the threat of the pandemic passes, the politics will, will return again? Um, well, um, it's a very good question and, and you know, keep keep pushing for the reform you're passionate about. I mean, don't, don't let a co-ed process or, or anyone slow you down. I mean, I, I think that's one of the great things about this country. Um, so many causes that people are passionate about having that opportunity to engage and make a difference. Um, but I, I think the truth is you're absolutely right. Like um, the, the big risk is that we go back to the way we were and it is undoubted that the pandemic has caused this. But I think that what, you know, Jay and I are saying is, uh, look, yes, an unprecedented challenge the country's facing has required everyone to come together in a very unique way. But, you know, look what you achieved. And if you kept this going, what is it you could do for, for the good of the country longer term? And I think that's, you know, why we both wanted to speak because we've seen how, what, how good it is. And yes, it has been created, but, you know, maybe try and keep it is what our, or keep it, is our urge because the pandemic will pass and, and what will happen is exactly what you've articulated. So, so we're as worried about that as you are. I think, Jay, that'd be my reflection. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, I mean, that's, I suppose, while we're trying to, one of the reasons we're calling for it to continue is because we're concerned for the very reasons you've explained that it might not. And so we think it's been such a positive thing. Uh, and we're, we're asking people just to reflect on that Think, think about what, I, I suppose what we're asking people to think about is what have we learned through this crisis that, that um, and we've learned, I think we've learned a, a lot of things. One is that when push came to shove, we put people before money. I mean, we, we've all sacrificed our economies to try and protect human life. Um, I think that's, 
that's an important thing. And, and my, some people have grumbled about it, but, but almost every nation in the world has done it. Uh, and the other thing we've learned is that we've got lots of strengths as a society. Um, and one of those strengths, uh, one of them is our public health system that's been demonstrated as a strength. But the other thing I think we've demonstrated is the strength of our federation, the way we can come together quickly to resolve, to resolve big issues. So, um, of course, this won't go on forever, but we think that if it could be extended just uh, for 12 months, that so much could be achieved in such a short period of time in an amazing way. Okay, we've got a couple of other questions from um, our participants. Uh, Karen Fairley. We've got Karen. Okay, well, I'm going to ask her question for her. Um, she's asking, is the National Cabinet diminished by the exclusion of the opposition leader? Um, and is this format another of SCOMO's strategies to sideline parliamentary and democratic process? Do you want right, me to have a crack at that? I might ask Jay that one. Yeah, I, I, I actually think it probably would have been in the Prime Minister's interest to include uh, the Leader of the Opposition in the, in the Cabinet process, entirely for, uh, for, I think it would be beneficial for him because it would be, it's very difficult once you've invited, what well, one if you invited the Opposition Leader into the process, it would have been impossible for him to resist. And then having been invited into the process, I think it would have been impossible for him to not be bound, in a sense, by the decisions that uh, were taken. So I think it would, have, it would have cut off a line of, you know, potential criticism. Um, I think now that emergency phase is over, it's probably less likely that, that, that something like that um, could occur, probably even less likely for the opposition to really want to be part of it as well, I imagine. But mm -hmm. because you're starting to see differences in, in so, you know, important differences emerge in, in philosophy and, and choices. But yeah, I, I think in the early days, it would, it would have probably been beneficial um, to, to even the Prime Minister himself and the National Cabinet for, uh, for the opposition leader to have been included. Yeah. Okay, and we have a question from Russell Ayres. Um, can we get Russell up? Hi, yes. Um, so my question is somewhat similar to one that's been asked already, uh, which is um, to what extent does the National Cabinet success uh, simply uh, be owed to um, the context, uh, the fact that we have a nationally recognised emergency uh, that everybody realises we have to act on rather than the mechanism of the National Cabinet per se. What is it about the National Cabinet that would work in a business as usual situation? Okay, so I think we might throw that one to Mike. That sounds yeah. like your cup of tea. Yeah, look, and I think um, look, there's, a, there's a couple of points. I mean, this is an, an unprecedented challenge, but there's many people who are going to put other challenges sort of on the table. Um, you know, the, the funding of aged care and where we go to on that is, is something that um, I'm increasingly passionate about moving into that sector. Um, climate change is something that is a, a big issue uh, facing the nation. There, there are many that you can start to bring forward um, that are gonna shape us for a generation. So, so the question um, I think becomes, uh, yes, this has been formed uh, out of a national crisis, but look what's been achieved. And, and surely we want a position um, where some of the big challenges we're facing, and um, later on I'll, I'll, I'll talk about health funding more broadly, um, and, and if we're going to act, we need to start acting now, and we need to do it in a way that, that is above uh, individual political point scoring on a daily basis. And, you know, I, I think that's really um, what we're trying to, to, to engender. Um, you know, we don't want people to be part of a process where it goes from you know, the morning news cycle to the afternoon news cycle to the papers and then we're done. It's what does this country need and all those leaders in position and, you know, in terms of the oppositions, how do we engage them and include that in it? But 
do we have an opportunity to address some of the big challenges? And there are many that are going to be ongoing beyond what we're doing in COVID. Can I, can I just maybe just add something to that? And um, Russell, probably, I probably should have expanded what I was talking about before about, um, you know, the mechanism. I actually think that just the regularity of the meetings and the fact that you are seeing your counterparts on such a, you know, intimate, regular basis, there's something actually quite, that, that actually is the way in which disputes or differences are resolved. And they're just, the, the frequency, uh, which tends to then lead to that more megaphone sort of diplomacy you see. Because if you're, you know, 10,000 miles away from someone, you know, shouting across the, you know, the, the, the country at them, it does, it's, not, it's sort of got an air of unreality about it. There's no political consequences of that. Whereas if you're seeing them every week and you've got so many things on the table, the ebb and flow of that negotiation disciplines the the interaction between you and the and the other leaders you know there's got there, there's no political price to be paid if you're only coming together every now and then there's a political price to be paid if you're seeing each other every week and you've got so many important things on the table because you're having there's a lot of give and give and take in that if there's something there might be one topic if the, depending on the breadth of the agenda if there's one topic that, that's difficult for you, but there's another topic where there's an advantage for you, then there can be a negotiation. And I think it's that, you know, when you set up the big trading table, when you put all the people that can make a difference around it, you can get some really interesting dialogue and, and deals that can be done. I think that's, that's really what I, I was trying to convey. Mm. And, and sorry, and I'll just, uh, plus one, Jay, sorry. Um, but I think that Jay's on to something that the concept of relationship is very powerful. And, uh, you know, Jay and I formed a, a very strong bond and friendship. It didn't matter what our political badge was. And we became very connected in uh, on, you know, what can we do for the nation given our stewardship of our current roles. And the, we had more capacity to do that and more chance to influence because of the relationship. And that comes from that sort of regular meeting and that purposeful connection um, that I think is is absolutely fundamental. And I, I, I think what I, the extension is on the, the National Cabinet, it's, I, I spoke about making it a, a safe place for public discussion. You don't want to discuss things like tax, re, tax reform. And, and in that context, well, as soon as someone expresses a view on one part of tax reform, well, that's it, that's their view. And, you know, the, the all types of ideologically and, we can politically prosecute them in election campaigns. If you have a discussion at a national cabinet on a whole range of options on what we might need to do to tax to fund uh, critical services going forward without that debate, well, that's a big step forward, you know, which is you know, what we were thinking of. And, and Anne, just one final thing. It's worth remembering how the national cabinet was born. The national cabinet was born out of the need for a COAG meeting to go into camera. In other words, go into private session because some of the information they're about to hear from the health officials was just so um, bombshell information that, that it was just something they had to consider themselves as a group. So it really, that's how it emerged. It was the, the need to have a, an open and pro, almost private dialogue that was actually how the thing was born in the first place. Mm. I didn't realise that. So um, we've got one more question and then we'll move on to um, our next topic. Uh, Ros Ch Chivers or Chivers, excuse if I got wrong. That's okay. Um, I'm just wondering your views on the role of, of um, local government who are represented at the COAG table but are not a member of, of National Cabinet because National Cabinet started with a health focus um, but is now broadening that focus. So just some ideas about the role of the little tier of government. Okay, Jay, do you want to have a go at that yeah, one? Yeah, well, of course, the, the Australian Local Government Association is represented at COAG meetings. Um, and um, I, I think, I mean, as we, as we sort of move into this sort of national, you know, reconstruction phase, if you like, of the, 
uh, the response. I, I think local communities, local places, and, and therefore local government will will need to play an important role in that. So, uh, for me, I, I see this sort of as a, the next phase, if you like, of the uh, of the response to the crisis, um, and uh, yeah, that that's the sense in which um, I think local government, indeed local communities, non-government organisations, can be deeply involved in 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 the next steps. Yeah. And Mike, what about, yeah. do you have a view about whether that it's useful to have local government in the room? Oh, oh look, I, I think it's, I mean, they need to be engaged and involved. As I, as I understand, um, the state governments are connecting um, into the local governments and their perspective, and they played a very key role um, in the COVID response. So, of, of course, they have to be involved. Um, obviously, the challenge in a room is how, how do you get so many um, local governments and associations? Yes, there's a the national chair, but it's, there are so many different voices uh, in local government that it makes a challenge. But uh, I think, I mean, it's undoubted they need to be involved. And I think um, the state government and the representatives that they've gone in, I understand um, that they've been connecting in with their local governments and kind of bringing that voice in. So, I mean, really important that the voice is undoubtedly there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, of course they were, uh, local government was intimately involved in enforcing some of the restrictions, particularly at our beaches. So um, I'm sure they feel that they have a stake in, a, in this reconstruction phase. Um, I'd like to move on to a slightly different topic, which is um, Jay's area of interest. Uh, I think uh, early learning has been very close to your heart and we've seen through this pandemic, the issues um, facing that sector. Um, do you think this, this is something that National Cabinet should perhaps grapple with? You know, where are we going on? If early learning was crucial to keeping the economy going, is it something mm -hmm. that National Cabinet should be exploring further? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, um, as Mike would remember, I, I was trying to put this on the COAG agenda and uh, I suppose in a way, um, while everyone would you know, nod politely and, and, and say that, yeah, this is really important. You know, that the, the processes at COAG are, are quite glacial. And, and so we weren't really able to shift the agenda very far through that process. But it, it does seem to me that this crisis, as I said before, has revealed a number of things that our strengths, like the public um, healthcare system, the Federation, but also some weaknesses like, um, uh, that the childcare sector almost fell over. In fact, um, it, they had to switch off the old system to actually keep it alive, and they're currently grappling with with how to deal with that. And I think once again, the government needs to be congratulated for that response. I mean, you know, the idea of free childcare, which would have been hitherto unimaginable, uh, was put on the agenda. But I think what it has done is it's reminded everybody one of about how essential childcare is to, to running the economy. Um, and I think it also, if, if you actually then sort of step back a bit and you think about what the challenges are going to be in the future, um, we're, we're going to have a constrained uh, population supply. There's, we're not gonna be able to dine out on the big population growth that we've seen uh, in the last few years in this uh, country, or last decade or two in this country. What that means, we're going to have to get more out of our existing workforce. What that means is lifts in labour force participation rate. And that really means women uh, who are underrepresented in that regard. And at the moment, we have a pretty punitive uh, childcare system where women in particular, but men, some men as well, but the, the, the fourth and fifth days of work, um, the effective taxation rate is over 100%. So in other words, you're having to pay money to go to work. So a lot of women choose part-time and we've got one of the highest part-time rates uh, of work for women in the world, largely because of the way in which our childcare system interacts. So there, there's a big reform task there and, that, and that's before you even ask the, what I would argue is the even more important question about early learning. So this, is, this isn't just about women working or, or men working. It's, it's about those first five years of life where we know that 90% of a child's brain develops. And that early learning is absolutely crucial to their future trajectory for 
uh, learning, health, well-being, and, and frankly, the national productivity of the nation. I mean, this is the big national productivity story, the human capital uh, that's uh, uh, really uh, implicit in, in every child. 300,000 children born every year, every single one of them um, needing that stimulation and activity to allow their brains to develop in a way which gives them the future capacity. I believe this is the big national productivity agenda and I think we've got a substandard system. It's been revealed by this crisis and I'd love to see this on the national agenda. Okay, so perhaps I can ask Mike, um, why do you think Jay's idea about extending early learning um, hit, a, hit, hit the rocks in, um, in COAG? What do you think was the block? Well, it's, I mean, it's hard to uh, pinpoint. I, th I think that the, the reality and the challenge of, of COAG is it gets consumed by the day-to-day -day political imperatives. So but by its very nature, it's short-term rather than long-term. Um, and I think the discussions that Jay led were, were incredibly impressive. I learned a lot uh, through that process by listening to Jay. And at the same time, because Jay was pushing this agenda, the, the public servants across the country uh, were providing kind of research and briefing and analysis um, that undoubtedly uh, would help sort of shape the conversation. But I, I think ultimately, as Jay said, the, the change in the um, Prime Minister, the, the different agendas and the day-to-day, -day, um, you know, consumed it. But, you know, Jay is now kind of pushing that agenda in it with a different role. And, uh, you know, I think the onus is on all of us to... Uh, to support him in that. I think it's incredibly important and I'm very hopeful that a process like a National Cabinet is exactly the sort of issue um, that would should be on there. Yeah, interesting. Um, so Jacinta Ardern has floated another idea in New Zealand, which is to have a shorter working week. Um, and I can see on the chat there's a whole lot of um, people saying, well, yeah, it's important to be able to participate in the workforce, but so too is it important to participate at home. Do either of you have a view about her proposal? How would that work in Australia? Well, well I, um, yeah, my initial reflection, I, I don't know whether um, it needs to be a, a shorter week. I mean, I haven't spent time reflecting on that, but, I, but I'll tell you what I think will change post. COVID is much more flexibility in, in terms of working from home. And, you know, that's going to provide um, all types of families, you know, joint, single, mutual opportunities in terms of managing day to day that mightn't have been here two or three months ago. Um, you know, we're, we're working at um, the, the NAB where I'm sort of finishing up this week uh, on potentially up to 50% of staff working from home. Uh, kind of ongoing and and that might mean you know one or two days a week it might mean whole weeks um, but it also means that you can be much more flexible on the hours you work and the way you work um, so I think that's interesting um, and I think that'll provide you know that sort of opportunity yeah I, I agree I mean I think the real issue is choice um, I mean there are a number of people women in particular who who are punished if they make a different choice. So, and, they, and they're and they choosing jobs which privilege flexibility because um, the, the, essentially the, the system punishes them financially if they, they want to work longer hours. So I, I've got, um, uh, I, I think um, if people choose to work part-time, um, I think that's, and choose to, uh, parent in, in that particular way, I think that should be supported, the system should support it. But if they also choose to, to work longer hours, they, they shouldn't, there shouldn't be a punitive regime which uh, punishes them. And I think that the debate has been seeing too much in terms of workforce participation. I think we should also see it as a system of early childhood development and a right for every child to learn right from the start. And that that just simply isn't available. I mean, and of course, because childcare is really an incident of employment policy and not really a child development um, policy, some of the people that need that support and assistance the most are locked out of it because they're not in the employment market or there are 
very tough tests about them getting access to uh, childcare uh, that, that, that exists at the moment. So I, I think this is a really important topic to have on the, the, the national agenda. Okay, so Mike, you're about to move into the aged care sector. Um, there will, there's obviously a lot of um, state and federal issues across aged care. How do you see that um, that sector being progressed through a national cabinet? What would be the priorities? Well, well the, the, there's, there's many priorities, but in essence, it's to provide uh, the best possible care we can. And uh, as, I, as I look at the funding, um, there is challenges around the model, but ultimately it appears that we are funding to a, an average level of care and to get to really good care, it, it often depends on the kind of not-for-profits, you know, out of the goodness of the people um, and, and the DNA of uh, their day-to-day -day operations, that they are um, providing excellent or exceptional care. So I think that the, the challenge for us as a nation is um, how do we want to look after our ageing population? How do we want to celebrate and improve the quality of life um, for them? And, you know, what is the best way to funding now everyone has a request for funding across um, many different issues uh, to the federal government and all state governments but all of us have ownership you know the the, the way we um, treat and deal with you know our population that aging I, I think it almost defines us uh, as a society and and I just don't think we've done anywhere near enough um, to celebrate and embrace and not just to provide exceptional care, but to improve the quality of life, to provide the opportunities um, well beyond, you know, just day-to-day -day surviving. We want to thrive. And it's, and it's an incredible challenge. So in terms of the National Cabinet, it's looking at, are we happy with the level of care we're providing? No. Well, what sort of outcomes do we want? And it's holistic. It's not just clinical outcomes. It's the, the, the quality of, of life that we are providing and supporting. Um, now, you know, that would compete with, with other funding priorities, but, you know, I certainly think, you know, similar to what Jay is arguing, I think we are a better and stronger country uh, with more we care and support uh, our ageing population. Okay. Now, Mike, um, I think one of your priorities for um, National Cabinet and certainly one of the things you worked on through COAG was some sort of um, some progression on tax reform, which has always been a very slow and fraught uh, matter between the states and the federal government. Um, now, I think you've got, got a quite interesting story about how you tried to progress some ideas on GST. Do you want to just perhaps tell us a little bit about that? <laughs> uh, yes. Um, so, uh, you know, bef be before we got there, the... Um, the challenge I looked at, uh, uh, well, we collectively looked at, if, if you look at 2020 to 2030 and the ageing population I just spoke about, um, and you did some modelling that, that said, assume the economy remains growing a trend, which is 3%, and that's just dramatically changed um, in the past few months. But by the time you get to 2030, in terms of the total budgets, state and federal, uh, you end up by 2030 with a deficit of about $30 billion. Now, that's on an ongoing basis. So there is, there is a massive shortfall coming in terms of the way we can fund our basic health care. And this is, this is just sort of basic affordable health care for, for the nation. Um, so, you know, one of the challenges policymakers is you can sort of look at that or you can try and address it now. So it's not going to deal with this election or the one after. In fact, it's going to be two or three sort of uh, people after you that might have to deal with the, the challenge. But I think the onus on you is to act now. And, um, so part of that was saying, can we look at the tax system and improve this? And that's where I sort of went to see Jay um, and said, Jay, look, this is something that we could work together with at COAG and at the process. It ended up sort of being at the retreat that Tony Abbott organised, um, you know, where we potentially increase um, the GST to help fund, um, you know, the, the health services into the longer term. We provided protections uh, for the vulnerable. Um, and, you know, that tax mix um, overall, and there were other proposals, other measures across the taxing, but that was at the core of it. Um, and, 
you know, Jay, you know, notwithstanding the challenges um, that would have had on his political side, there was challenges on my political side, but we thought it was worth the discussion um, and, and pushing it forward. And I think that um, kind of proved constructive. Jay. Jay. Yeah, yeah, and and it just it was worth remembering the context. So back in two thousand and fourteen, we had the uh, the, the so called uh, hockey Abbott budget, which cut eighty billion dollars out of health and uh, education uh, over ten years, and we complained about that for a bit. Uh, Mark and I did, and then we sort of realised well, it wasn't changing, and so we had to. Um, Mike did some analysis which demonstrated the very point that he just raised, that is that in the long term we weren't going to be able to fund this system uh, and that we needed to come up with an answer. And you remember at the time the re rhetoric from the conservative side of politics is that we had a spending problem. In other words, we we're just spending too much on our public hospitals and that we should just uh, be more efficient. And of course anybody that was running a public hospital system knew that was nonsense. And so when Mike proposed really his initiative around increasing the GST, it was, it was really one of the first conservative leaders that said, well, we don't just have a, sure, we can be more efficient, but we don't just have a spending problem, we've got a revenue problem. So from my perspective, when I see a conservative leader um, defying the conservative orthodoxy, and reaching across the aisle to say, well, look, we need to, we need to think of this on both the revenue and the expenditure side. I, I thought intellectually, as much as it caused me heartburn politically, I needed to welcome that, that intervention. And so that's where our discussion began. I mean, as, as it happened, and when I look more deeply at the proposal that Mike put to me, because he was talking about a I think uh, compensation for people up to 100,000, was it? Something like that. Yeah, that, that actually meant that a lot of the lower paid were protected. And then I looked, and if you actually look at the disproportionate use of health services by people on lower incomes, see, to evaluate the you know, progressive or regressive nature of this, you need to look at what the money's being spent on. And you know, if you get, if, if people on lower incomes are going to otherwise uh, not have access to those services or have to pay co-payments to, to cope with this, essentially this crisis, you end up, it puts a different perspective on the equity question. And so I, I that's why I was prepared to, to ultimately have that discussion and welcome it. But in the end, I, I ended up sort of proposing a slightly different idea, and that is that the, the, the states would get a share of, uh, of Commonwealth income tax uh, so we would trade in all our specific purpose payments and cash them in there, get a fixed percentage of what is a growth tax, the personal income tax, which has gives us a, a, a tax that grows at a rate which is more proximate to the rate of growth of health expenditure, and then leave the Commonwealth, if they wanted to, to pursue the increase in the GST. And at the time, that made a bit of sense because the Commonwealth had a short-term budget problem. We had a long-term budget problem. Um, but in the end, that all disappeared into the... Uh, leadership misery of the Liberal Party and uh, we didn't get very far. But. <laughs> yeah, so there's a bit broader than that, Jay, but yes. You're, you're, you're <laughs> right. uh, but the other, the, the other thing as well is uh, I think, you know, with these challenges and funding, like, uh, you know, at the core, and, and we've seen it, what, what um, you know, the, the salaries that we're providing, we're providing kind of our nurses and our, our care workers, like the, the, the sectors are gonna become uh, under increasing pressure. Uh, we require more. Uh, they're going to face more challenges, um, more skills, and we have to value them. Um, so, you know, the funding is is also uh, needs to be considered uh, in that context as well. Okay, so I'm going to ask uh, John Robertson, uh, a former New South Wales opposition leader, if he'd like to chip in at this stage. Um, right. John, are you there? Hi, Mike. How are you? Good day, Joe. Good day, mate. Um, yeah, look, I think for a lot of us, we've enjoyed cooperation that we're seeing through the National Cabinet and for those leaders that are sitting at the table, they're all benefiting from the lift they're getting in confidence people have in our leaders to actually solve some of the bigger issues. I guess I've got two things or two questions. One is, what do you see as the greatest threats to the continuation of this cooperation? And then secondly, what do we need our pollies or the wider community to do to stop 
the reversion back to the divisive personal politics that we've seen previously because um, I think it's a huge opportunity and for those of us that watch it's been thoroughly impressive to see what can be achieved but there's always that challenge of someone will just revert back and suddenly we go back to normal so I'd be interested to see what you think the threats are and you know what the wider community can do and all of us can do to stop that or say hey you know that's not the way we want to see our country led. Yeah, I, look, it, it's interesting. I I saw the Prime Minister's speech yesterday, who seemed to be channeling a bit of Bob Hawke there about, you know, reaching out to, to the unions, et cetera, and, and other things. I mean, that's, that's interesting. Um, and that um, seems to suggest that uh, he sees some benefit in this, this more collaborative uh, corporatist sort of model kind of continuing. Um, look, I think that the pace really is going to be set, or the tone is going to be set by the Prime Minister. I mean, if ultimately he's sort of the, the chair of the, this meeting at the moment, and he can, he can either allow it to descend back into uh, business as usual, or he can elevate it um, and keep it at the, its present level. So I think a lot of it will come down uh, to him. But... Um, it's a, it's about taking risks in a way, like just as Mike and I took a risk, you know, in our dialogue with each other. You've got you you've got to um, you know it, it really expose a bit of vulnerability in your own leadership to um, to criticism, to to take a risk um, in in reaching out into areas that um, probably cross the political aisle. So. It's a question of what the, whether there's an appetite for that. I'm not entirely sure whether I know what could what could assist that. I, I mean, encouraging, you know, ordinary everyday South Australians encouraging them to maintain this, I think it's the important thing. Yeah, and, and look, I'd, I'd say, Robert, um, I, I can see it now. I can, I can see the advisors uh, around the individual premiers um, and they're saying, okay, um, Premier, what we need to do is we need to start distancing yourself uh, from this, from the Prime Minister. Uh, we need to get back to our agenda and we need to find the issue that uh, we need to fight on. Like, I, I literally think that that sort of discussion could be going on. You know, whereas, uh, you know, the individuals that take the, take the view, look, we want this to keep going. So the Prime Minister, um, whatever individual's view, I, I think he's done a first-class job here the premiers have done a first-class job, all of them, across the table. We, we need uh, to encourage them to keep going. So we don't want to see you have to go back and to fight with Canberra and to identify yourself. Like, we want you to keep pursuing what is good for the country long-term. So please keep that going. Please keep that mindset. Um, that's the role we can play. And I think that there's an openness, and, you know, Jay alluded to it. If, if the PM, in, you know, taking the next step of national cabinet, what other stakeholders can we include? Um, you know, unions, oppositions, how, how do we challenge some of the bigger issues and how do we have that forum that is understood? That's what this is for. You know, this is for taking the nation forward in some of the biggest challenges. So the risk is exactly that. We go back to politics as old. The advisors will be sort of wanting that to happen. The onus is on us to encourage them to keep going because there's, there is a lot that can be done, even if it's just for 12 months. Okay, so we've got another question from Sarah Charlton. Um, Sarah. Uh, thanks very much, Anne. Um, my question is, could there be, would this be an opportunity to have a people's cabinet or a representative forum that reports to the national cabinet? Um, given that we're now using this kind of technology routinely, um, it could be an opportunity to, to get it happening. And I think that such there is evidence that such groups strengthen democracy as opposed to the influence of lobbyists and vested interests in Canberra. Yeah, can I, can I have a crack at that one, Anne? Yeah, um, sure. Look, Go. I've, I've been involved in some discussions with a, a range of um, groups um, that um, have been proposing really community groups that um, grassroots organisations that uh, have really been inspired, I suppose, by these new levels of cooperation that we're seeing. And I think there is a real appetite for a coming together, if you like, of something in the nature of a, a community recovery summit. And um, so we've, um, 
I think I can say today that, that we're hoping to pull together a summit of that sort. We've, we've fixed a, a date on the 1st of July where we do want to bring people together uh, to actually maintain the momentum that's begun, if you like, in this country. And, you know, some of the topics that, uh, that have been discussed today could be on the agenda for discussion, things like aged care and early childhood, uh, perhaps issues like jobs and schools and, and housing. These are things that I think communities can buy into um, uh, and we can maintain some of the, the good momentum that's emerged. Okay, Mike, do you want to add, do you have a view about a community cabinet? Well, I think the, I, I think the concept, uh, the first thing, I think, you know, Jay, good on you. I think that's a sort of great initiative. You know, I think the, uh, the risk, of course, is that, you know, we end up being disparate from the central um, sort of national cabinet. So I think you're proposing it kind of connects into the national cabinet process, um, clearly. Um, but uh, in terms of the community, I, I think it's a great idea. And, you know, just this, this forum, the new, the new way of communicating and engaging is changing and COVID has changed that. Um, so, you know, direct, real-time um, community engagement on some of those issues we're talking about uh, would be an incredibly powerful addition. I mean, it's, it's unending. Um, the opportunities on how we bring people together um, on some of these challenges, but it would be an undoubtedly better process if we were able to include that. Um, perhaps if I could just ask a question, um, the greatest moral challenge of our time um, dealing with climate change, do you think that the National Cabinet would provide a forum for uh, more, more um, coherent thinking on um, you know, a national energy policy and uh, a, a policy to reduce our carbon footprint? Uh, maybe I can start with Jay, who's had a very famous interaction with um, Josh Frydenberg on energy policy. Yeah, it was a bit emotional that day. I, yeah, I, seem, yeah. to, I seem to remember. <laughs> probably, probably not the tired, greatest. We had a bit tired and grumpy, were you, Joe? Was no, it? I was actually quite relaxed that day. He had upset. <laughs> um, I hate to the, see it when you weren't relaxed. <laughs> we, but look, it's probably not a great advertisement for cooperation that moment. But um, but what um, what's interesting actually about uh, national energy policy is that all of the constitutional authority resides with the states. It's always been a source of confusion for me why the Commonwealth have bought so heavily into it. And I think it's largely because it's part of that, you know, those climate wars that, that everyone have been waging for such a long time. And so, you know, it's been, when, when, you, when you're sort of running around with these sort of big slogans that, that uh, you know you're in the realms of politics and not trying to actually solve sort of problems. So, uh, you know, I think, shifting the the location of the debate um uh, you know these this is something the states could all sort out for themselves i mean the states and regions and cities are actually the big engine rooms for for, for grappling with climate change I and mean, it's the energy systems it's the transport systems it's the way cities are run um you know a lot of the work can actually be done you don't need the commonwealth i mean the commonwealth um can help and or hinder but, but so much can be done through the state. So, I mean, there's no reason why this forum couldn't be a forum uh, that can gain a, a collaborative arrangement between the states uh, here. And, and certainly constitutionally, they need the states. I mean, the great irony is that the national energy uh, legislation is passed through a state parliament and is replicated in each of the other state parliaments because the Commonwealth doesn't have constitutional authority. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's just, I mean, it's just an undoubted uh, reality and a, and a very obvious discussion to have at the National Cabinet. If you, if you go back to the, the premise I'm looking for, it's that safe place to discuss some of the bigger issues, uh, to bring the best minds and the best research and in climate change context, the best science into a discussion, enable people to participate in it uh, and to form views. Um, so, you know, I know how fraught it is. I know how divisive it is. Um, but it, I think it's exactly the sort of issue that would benefit uh, from the sort of discussion that, that Jay and I are talking about. Um, and, you know, Jay certainly was passionate across a range of issues. I remember I was at a press conference one morning and they said, well, you know, what do you think about what Jay Weatherall said? And I said, well, he's very sensible. I'm sure it was a very sensible comment. And it was something about 
me taking water from South Australians. Um, <laughs> and so well, we called uh, you a thief or something. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, he's got a strong view. Um, but you know, again, the, the, you know, that um, Murray Basin uh, water plan, uh, another issue that, it, mm. that shouldn't, you know, be day-to-day -day interaction about Jay and I or the South Australian and the New South Wales premiers. It, it should be about, you know, as a nation, let's, let's address this. So. Okay, well, it'd be remiss of me not to ask what we as the media need to do to change, to facilitate a more um, cooperative um, climate in Australian politics. So um, perhaps if, uh, if I can start with you, Mike, do you have a view about um, what the media needs to do, whether you need to slow down on the tweets or, um, you know, Look, what do I, we I, need to do? I'd, I'd say two things. I'd, I'd say um, that, uh, you know, focus on the long term as much as the short term. So, you know, one of, one of the challenges we have, and it's, it's our political leaders, there is this high propensity to have to deal with the day to day um, versus, you know, there are some very significant long term challenges that we're facing. Um, they might not turn up today or next year or in the next three or four years, but they are coming. And how can we, you know, as state nations start to address them and i think so i think that would be a kind of very helpful thing that the others is staying on this issue of the national cabinet and, and you know as, as i think of it evolving one of the things that that i would see is you know the national cabinet would produce public policy documents um research documents bringing some of the best minds um that could be published and disseminated um and then collectively engage with um to, to shape the agenda so rather than having a political um, sort of bent to it, it's, you know, his or her idea or this or that party, you know, here's some thinking on some of these big challenges we've spoken about um, and giving airtime to the thinking in both sides of the debate and to try and fill it out, um, to give it some space um, to the leaders to watch and, and observe before having to engage and lay their markers down. So I think those two things I think would be really helpful there. Okay, Jay. Yeah, I mean, just uh, quality journalism, which um, uh, which assists the richness and the the debate. I mean, the the trying to to make sure that we see issues from all of the different perspectives, rather than the the very sort of black and white, trimmed down um, sort of slogans. Um, I think you know, in rewarding politicians that try and have intelligent discussions. And punishing those that, um, that that try and dumb down the debate. I think that's the role that good journalists can play. And you know, there is there's some great journalism, and um, you know, we should, um, but you know, they they should re re reward the long term thinkers and the people that are trying to have the big, sensible debates. Okay, so we're nearly out of time. Um, I just wanted to ask you both to paint your best case scenario for the next twelve months. Um, what can we expect out of National Cabinet? What, what do you think would be the best case scenario? I'll start well, it goes, yeah, well, it goes on for 12 months. Uh, and uh, all of the big public policy agendas that we've discussed today are put on the table. Uh, and that there's an, an open dialogue that, that reaches down uh, all the way from the, the top of from our nation's leaders all the way down to our local communities and we get um, some serious reform and change. And can I just add this? Our, our budgets um, across the nation are all smashed through COVID. So this idea of, you know, trying to think about the next three years and returning to surplus and all of that, that's, that's off the agenda. Some of the big long-term issues, which we know give us big, in, incredibly important returns like early childhood, have always been seen to be too hard because they're well beyond the lifetime of any politician. They might give returns in 20 years time. Well, that's the style of thinking that we need now. It's, it's never been more important to look at the long term. And so in a, in a, in a terrible way, COVID has, has sort of uh, given us the, the opportunity to think uh, beyond the day to day and, and think well into the next generation, the next generation of children who are going to have to uh, to live in this society we were created for them. And deal with the debt that will be left. Absolutely. Of course. Um, Mike? 
I think, look, very quickly, it would be um, an incredible success if it was still here and, and the agenda had moved from COVID. I, I think it's that simple. So I, I, uh, because if it has, then there's a real opportunity that this takes hold and some of the things that we're talking about could really start to be addressed. So I don't think um, you need any grander ambitions than that because if it's still here in 12 months, I, I really think it would become part of uh, our nation's future and really that would be an incredible opportunity um, that I think we'd all be very thankful for. Okay, well, um, any chance we'll see you back in politics? Uh, I've got a new role, Anne, and I'm very excited by it. Um, <laughs> so okay. I, I've, I've said um, that, uh, well, Jay and I have both retired and we're both very happy uh, where we are, but I think, you know, I don't think Jay Weather would be fantastic in federal politics. Not in a million years. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, look, on that note, I think we might say um, thank you very, very much for participating. It's been really, really interesting and I've got to say uplifting as well, which is what we need to hear from our, our politicians and former politicians. So thank you both very much. Thank you, Anne. Thank you for doing that. Thanks, Anne. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jack. Thanks, everyone. There. Thanks, Mike.